Okay, so what you're seeing right now is what's going to be on the first page of the exam. I just want to make this kind of clear ahead of time. So directions have been a little bit of an issue in the past with north, south, east, west, that kind of thing. So just to make it completely consistent, this is going to show up on the front page of the exam. Uh, up means up towards the top of the exam sheet, whatever page you're on. Down means down towards the bottom of it. Left means left, right means right, out of the page and into the page. And then the dot and cross are just another symbol for out of the page and into the page. So this will be uh, there, and this is how I want you to specify directions. If you're asked about the direction of a field or a force or something like that, um, is in terms of left, right, up, down, out of the page or into the page. And that's also how directions will be given for any problems. So with that, I'm gonna jump into the notes and just review those, and then we'll do practice problems. So um, let's see, uh, magnetic forces and magnetic fields. So we introduced the idea of magnetic fields and we have some intuitive sense of that of north and south pole that like poles repel unlike attract. The direction of the field lines is based on the north pole because it's the direction of small compass points at each location and that is um, right at the North Pole is going to be away from the North Pole, right at the South Pole is going to be towards it. At other points in space, it's not quite one or the other, it's somewhere in between, but that's why we say that field lines leave a North Pole and enter a South Pole. The Earth's magnetic poles are not really critical here to remember. Um, but this was just showing that Earth behaves like a bar magnet and so does have a certain axis for its poles. Um, so just to get another sense of where this shows up in everyday life. So I guess we can say that's not super important. This absolutely is the force on a charge. A has to be a moving charge and B has to have a velocity component perpendicular to the direction of the field. If it is parallel to the field, like in this first case, you get no force. If it is exactly perpendicular, you get the largest possible force. And if it is somewhere in between, you get a force somewhere in between zero and the maximum possible. If the charge is not moving, you also get zero magnetic force. For any cases where you do have a perpendicular component, you can use the first right-hand rule. And so uh, I said in an email, if this is just not clicking for you, you wanna make some props or something that's like some popsicle sticks with V, V and F like that, you can. Um, but you'll have to remember, for instance, if V is not, exactly perpendicular, like in this picture, you're thinking about the component of it that's perpendicular to the actual, uh, to, the, to the field. And that's the component that you'd line up this thing with your little prop with, if you wanted to do it that way. If not, you just want to use the right hand rule, that's fine. You point your thumb in the direction of the, uh, or in the direction the charge is moving, you point the rest of your fingers towards the field and your palm is going to determine the direction of the magnetic force. So uh, if it's a positive charge, that force points away from your palm. It's like pushing away from your palm. If it is a negative charge, you flip that direction for the force. So it's going to be towards your palm. So you could be asked given the direction of the uh, charges velocity, the direction is moving, and the direction of a magnetic field, what is the direction of the force on a charge? You could also be asked, given the force and the velocity, what is the direction of the field? So you have to kind of be able to go from one to the other and think about, well, in order for that charge to be feeling a force in a particular direction, meaning the way your palm faces, 
when it's moving a certain other direction, the way your thumb faces, which way do your fingers have to point in order for that field to do that, to apply that force. So just taking any two of those and finding the third. You'll also need to be able to find the size of that magnetic field or magnetic force. This equation covers both ways. You just solve for the relevant thing. It says that the field is defined by the force felt by a small test charge divided by the size of the charge over the perpendicular component of its velocity. But we ended up mostly using it in this form. Just rearranging for that force. But either way, um, if you're given the force and the velocity, you can find the field strength. If you're given the field strength and the velocity, you can find the force. So <laughs> this example is really good. Um, I'm not going to harp too much on acceleration in this one. So this last bit, it is just Newton's second law. So it's just the added step of dividing by mass because the direction is going to be the same, but one less thing to worry about. Something that is important to think about is um, if we have the electron case, for instance, that doesn't change the magnitude of the force, but it does change its direction. So that's that idea of flipping the direction of the force so that it's towards your palm if you've got a negative charge. Um, okay. Deflection of a charge in a magnetic field is just an application of the right-hand rule. So, um, we are more concerned with the magnetic field case because we've already looked in detail at the electric field. So this side was just to kind of, by analogy, talk about the magnetic field. Um, so the idea is that because of that force, whose direction is determined by the right-hand rule, a charge will be deflected and it will be deflected in a circular path always. That is because um, the velocity is always going to be perpendicular to the force, and so no work can be done on the charge. Its speed can't change. The only path that's going to allow that is a circular path. So you could see a question, something like, um, if you're given the direction a charge ends up being deflected in a certain field. So say maybe the field points into the page or something. If the charge was originally moving to the right, I want to know um, maybe what direction is the force that it's feeling uh, as soon as it enters this region with the field, or maybe what uh, kind of charge, positive or negative, that sort of thing. So how we would answer that is, use black to kind of label some things. It was going to the right. So its velocity points to the right. The field points into the page. And so our right-hand rule says, if I point my thumb to the right and fingers into the page, and again, I'm not going to use camera here just because it's going to flip everything anyway and make it a little bit more difficult. Um, but that would tell you that the force on a positive charge would be up. So up towards the top of this page because your finger's sort of dipping into the page. So that does agree with the fact that the charge deflects that way. If instead it had gone the other way in a circle, then that would have told us that this force direction is incorrect. And so in that case, we're actually dealing with a negative charge because the force is the opposite direction in order for it to be able to be deflected downward like that. So given the path it takes in a certain magnetic field, you can figure out what type of charge it is. Um, and that is more important to me than necessarily the radius of that path, which we did look at. Um, 
I think this is a good example just for the sake of more practice with figuring out what direction the magnetic force is. Not so much about the balancing stuff, but just another practice with the magnetic force. Anyway, so this right here, finding the radius of that circular path, not so critical to me. What's more important is figure out the direction of the force and what that's going to cause the particle to do. What kind of circle, what direction, that sort of thing. Um, so we can kind of knock that out. And really a lot of this conceptually though, it is important to remember those things about circular motion, like no work is done. So kinetic energy doesn't change, speed doesn't change, direction does, um, but uh, it, it can't ever speed up or slow down in a magnetic field. So this stuff is still important. Electric field still just, that's an analogy we made. So that's not super critical here. Conservation of energy. Um, so this was just, if we had a, essentially this is a spectrometer set up. Um, the conservation bit was actually just to get the speed at the plate right before it entered this field. So to me, that's not super important here. That could be a thing on the final, for instance, because that's combining some concepts and that can happen on the final. But again, what's more important is just knowing how the charge is going to be deflected if it enters a certain magnetic field and what that says about if it's a positive or negative charge. So the calculations here, not critical, but directions are super important. We even have an example that really looks like this in the practice exam. And that's for good reasons, knowing the direction the charges will go based on their sign and magnitude. Um, okay, force on a current. The right-hand rule is exactly the same as for um, a single moving charge, because all a current is is just a bunch of charge moving together. So all we do is instead of the velocity, we have the current. And um, if we do that, point our thumb along the current, fingers along the field, that'll tell us the direction of the force. Uh, the kind of nice thing with current, though, is since we always use conventional current, the force always ends up pointing away from our palm for currents. We don't talk about negative currents. Um, <clears throat> OK, so I guess we do in, in terms of electron flow, but that was just to figure out some things. So I would still say that it's, it's best to just think of for currents, you can just always think positive. Um, the equation for current, that is an important one. It is just sort of a spin on this QVB sine theta one. It's just writing it in terms of current. Let me go back to green here. <clears throat> so that's important, but it's derivation. It's not. Um, and so this example is a good one. Don't worry about acceleration, just finding the force on a wire that's carrying a current. You use ILB sine theta, where L is the length of the wire. Um, sine theta is the angle between the magnetic field and the current passing through the wire. And then uh, B is the field strength. Torque. Um, <clears throat> I would again say direction is the important thing here. This is just a bunch of right-hand rules to figure out the force on these wires. So when they're in this field, if we're looking at a top-down view, uh, it's pointing to the right and the current is pointing into the page for this bottom bit and out for the top, just... <coughs> Oops, sorry, I had that flipped. So this is actually out. It's into the page. And so right-hand rule would tell us if our thumb's pointing into the page and our hands pointing to the right, the rest of our fingers, then that force would be, uh, for into the page, it would be down. And for out of the page for that current, it would be up. So it's lots of uses of the right-hand rule. The derivation, not important. Um, 
you could have like max one question about finding the torque on a coil of wire, but there is only one equation in all three chapters that says anything about torque, and it's this one right here. So um, I wouldn't be too worried about that one. Magnetic moment, I'm not gonna ask for magnetic moment, so you don't really need to remember what that is, but you could be asked about the torque. It's maximum when the um, coil is uh, perpendicular to the field, so, <clears throat> or the, the normal of it is perpendicular to the field, so it is kind of along the field direction. It's minimum when the coil is perpendicular to the field direction. But for us, it's just the maximum possible is in IAB because sine phi can only be one at most. Second right-hand rule is arguably more important than the first because it carries through not only in this chapter, but also pretty much is the backbone of the whole next chapter. So if the second right-hand rule doesn't make sense at this point, it really needs to before this exam. But like I said, you can also bring in props for this. If it helps to physically have something to grab onto, a stick or even a pencil or something, to say if the current's going a certain way, I point my thumb in the direction of that current and wrap my fingers around, that tells me the field direction, do that. So I think a confusion here that maybe is worth addressing right now is figuring out what direction the field points at a particular location. So I think maybe it is better to think of this as a two-step process than just the one. So, and really maybe three, if one of them is current, one of them is curling the fingers. We'll say there's a third, and that's about finding the field at a particular location. So if I take my current and say it is up like this, Curling my hand around with my thumb pointed in the direction of the current is going to tell me that the field wraps around like that. So if I'm looking down at this from, from up here, that's my kind of line of sight, then that's going to show me current coming out of the page. I'm saying the second right-hand rule tells me that the magnetic field circles around that wire like that and then of course, you've got larger circles, but they're all directed the same way. And so um, the third step is if I want to know what the field is, what direction it's going maybe to the left of this wire in this original picture, then I have to think about which direction the field is pointing at that location because the field's pointing in a different direction at each location around the wire. Over here, so that's where that point would be in this view, that field is pointing straight down because the field lines tell us the direction of the field at each point in space. They're always tangent to the field vectors. If I wanted to know about the field in front of the wire, so right here in the top down view, that's pointing to the right. That's what that one's doing. And then I guess just for extra awareness, that one's pointing out. Um, if I wanted to know to the right of the wire, so right here, it's pointing that way. And so from this perspective, that's into the page and then back behind the wire, which I won't draw because that's just gonna be confusing, but it would point to the left. So you have to think about where the point is on that circle and that'll tell you what direction the field is at that exact location. So that's step three. Um, field is tangent to the circular field lines. At each point. And it's tangent in a way that it follows the direction that the circle is going around. So this circle is counterclockwise. And so we always draw them so that they're agreeing with that counterclockwise direction. Um, 
don't have to really memorize anything about the field strength because they're given on the exam, but you do need to be able to calculate and know the difference between applying the equations for a straight wire, a loop of wire, and solenoid is not so much on there about calculating that. So let's just say, don't worry about the solenoid field strength. Direction, again, all three, it's important to be able to apply it, but it's the same rule for all three. It's the second right-hand rule. So um, if you forget which one to apply between this one and this one right here, for one, it does say um, the field strengths are labeled. So if I go back to the practice exam, I have them actually labeled as the stray wire, the loop, and the solenoid. Um, but if you forget, usually you're only ever going to be asked anything about the center of the loop if you're talking about a loop of wire, because that's all we have a simple equation for. Anyway, direction, right hand rule. But the tricky part is now you're laying your thumb onto this circular loop. And so if that is confusing, bring a roll of tape or something else circular that has a hole in the middle for your fingers to be able to go through. And then you put your thumb in the direction the current's going. The way your fingers wrap through that loop is going to tell you which way the field points. It can only point sort of into or out of that loop. In this picture, that's meaning either left or right, because we're only talking about dead center of the loop. And if I, I'll draw it on this picture, because of the way these lines sort of swirl around, that tangent direction is, in this case, off to the left. And that's all we ever care about is dead center of the loop. Um, attracting and repelling is relevant to know. Um, but the idea is just if you can say that the uh, field lines point in the same direction, you're going to have these two loops attract if they point in opposite directions. So those are in opposite directions. They're going to repel. And that's because that's telling us the direction of the North Pole um, for our magnet created by this loop, this electromagnet. For a solenoid, if you're confused on the direction of the magnetic field, just pretend it's one single loop. It works exactly the same as one single loop. So if the current is going around a certain way in just that single loop, the second right-hand rule tells you if your thumb's pointing in the direction of that current, the field must be pointing to the left. Um, this example, is good practice for both right-hand rules because you have to use the second one to figure out the direction of the magnetic field due to this wire. And that's still that idea of second right-hand rule just tells us it circles around like that. That quote unquote third step is to say, well, the field uh, direction is always tangent to that field line. And so right at this particular point we're interested in, that would say the field points that way, tangent to that circle in the direction it's, it's circling around the wire. The first right-hand rule is then, now you know the field direction at this point where this charge is, you know which way the charge is moving, that's that uh, upward direction. And then you can use that to figure out the force on the charge. So, if you're given a current direction and ask about a field, that's second right-hand rule. If you're given a force and a velocity or a force and a current, that's first right-hand rule. It's really about what you're trying to find. Usually for second, it's finding a current or a field. For first, it's finding a force or sometimes the magnetic field. Ones like this, where you have two separate types of fields going on, like a straight wire and a loop, uh, that's a little bit too much for the exams. So that will not be on there. Okay, uh, induction. 
So the kind of short summary of induction is that if you have any change in the magnetic field experienced by a loop of wire or multiple loops, that is going to induce a current in uh, that coil, loops, whatever it is. So those changes could be, this is said later, but let's just say it here, changes could be due to the field strength, the loop or coil. So coil just means a bunch of loops, loop or coil orientation, the loop or coil area. This field strength one has a couple different ways that it can change. It could change through motion. That's this first thing we looked at, relative motion. Um, it could be due to actively changing the field strength. So meaning like you have something producing the field and you turn it down. Or and really, this is one way you could change the field strength if the field's being produced by um, a coil of wire, changing the current through that coil, because that changes the field strength, like we just said, uh, with all of these equations. If you change the current, you change the field strength. That's going to change the flux through a loop or coil of wire. Um, by and large, the stuff in this chapter is about applying Lenz's law and calculating induced EMFs and currents. So can you, given a situation like this of, um, say, stretching a wire, figure out the direction of the induced current that flows in it, or Maybe you're squishing it back, so you're increasing the area of the loop. Can you figure out the direction of the current in that case? Um, and that all really boils down. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to Faraday's law. So everything from where I just was up to here is kind of all baked into Faraday's law. Uh, motional EMF is one example, so we do happen to have a specific equation for it, but um, so that one right there, that one's a direct consequence of Faraday's law, and we could actually solve any problems with motional EMF as far as finding the induced EMF strictly with Faraday's law without having to use this specific equation. Um, so... I will say so the derivation stuff definitely is not on there. But applying this equation or Faraday's law, if you're talking about a rod moving on a circuit, in any case, doesn't matter how the EMF was induced, this applies if you've just got a resistance connected to your circuit. That just is Ohm's law. It doesn't care where the voltage came from or the current. It just says they're related by this resistance if all that's connected to the circuit is a resistive element like a light bulb or something. So um, these first two parts are probably the most relevant for that. Uh, this gets talked about again in terms of Lenz's law and that's the more direct way to look at it. So this was like, we're going back to physics one using that reasoning to show that it makes sense the way things are moving in terms of conservation of energy. The Lenz's law is the big kind of easy way to apply conservation of energy. You need to know how to calculate flux to be able to apply Faraday's law. It's field strength times area times the cosine of the angle between the field direction and the normal to the area of whatever loop. So the normal is again, the direction perpendicular to the face of that loop. If you've got like a, a tennis racket or something, you pretend that's your loop, you stick a Nerf dart on it. It's the way the Nerf dart's gonna point straight out away from the tennis racket. That's your normal. 
And so that's what we care about for like a uh, angle between that and the field direction. That's going to be what theta or sorry phi is measured for. Um, so I would recommend going back through some of these examples of calculating flux because it's going to help in applying Faraday's law to find an induced EMF. This is all derivation to get to the idea of Faraday's law. So this definitely is the most important equation in the entire chapter. Um, and so these two examples of applying it are good. Um, also good practice, like I've mentioned before. We'll talk about Lenz's law here in a second, but again, these currents, the way they're drawn are correct based on the change that's happening. So in this case, I'm moving this magnet to the right or making it a stronger magnet. The current is going to go sort of into the page um, that way around the loop. And similar for the other two, if you can figure out using Lenz's law why those currents go those ways, you're in a good place for applying Lenz's law on the exam. Those are good practice. Uh, GFCI is not on there. Lenz's law, absolutely 100% on there. <clears throat> the idea is that nature does not like it when flux changes, and so it always tries to undo whatever change happened. Um, and it does that by introducing or inducing a current in the loop where the flux changed to create a magnetic field that opposes that change in flux. It is a result of conservation of energy because if the induced field added to the flux, that would result in a stronger field and that would induce a stronger current and it would just not conserve energy. We'd get energy out of nothing. So this has to be this way for energy to be conserved. Do not skip steps in applying Lenz's law. Do this every single time. I promise you that is the easiest way. There's, uh, I, there's nothing wrong with shortcuts, but this is one where you will make mistakes if you do not kind of follow this to the T because there's so many directions and things involved and it's very easy to mess up one. That also means if you're seeing induced current in a problem, so you're seeing, uh, it asks which way does the induced current flow in this circuit? Your first instinct should not be second right-hand rule to figure out the direction of the field. That's step three. Your first instinct should be Lenz's law if you see induced current or induced magnetic field. These examples go through that in detail. I also have those other examples of applying it posted on the Wiley page. So in all, there's at least six or seven examples. Um, a really good one to look at is the one that's posted and there's similar ones on the practice exam where you've got like two coils side by side and you do something to one of the coils, what happens or which way does the current flow in the other based on that change. That is, Lenz's law is the way to figure that out. Generators, um, one question max, and it pretty much just is, what is the induced EMF in the generator? If you're told it's a generator and you're asked about the induced EMF, it's a good chance that it is just applying this equation right here. If it's in the context of just the generator, if it's an RCL circuit, we have some other equations involving those things. And so that's probably the better way to think about it. But uh, if you're just told you've got a generator with a number of coils and an area and a field strength, find the induced EMF, that's how you do it. And this equation covers that. I also did another example that I posted on generators. Self-inductance and mutual inductance are also more important in terms of directions of things. So, 
really this was all kind of a means to the end of transformers because they are an application of both self-inductance and mutual inductance. So I'll just go, I'll go ahead and say, don't worry about these. Really, maybe I should have something on them on the exam, but I don't. So transformers, yes. Not this stuff that was deriving. I hope you're also not just like scratching this out in like dark pen or something because, you know, maybe these notes are something worth keeping after the class. Who knows? Um, maybe you're not even scratching out. It might just be better to make a note off to the side. That's to your discretion. Anyway, your two best friends for transformers are these two equations right here. And really, the first one is your, your best best friend because it's the one that the subscripts line up. So voltage agrees with the turns ratio. Voltage across secondary over primary is turns across secondary over primary. The one that doesn't is the current. You've got secondary primary, primary secondary. As long as you remember that, and those are also in the um, uh, equation sheet or on the equation sheet, uh, then you're fine. It's just knowing what goes where. So you'll be told the voltage across the secondary is so-and-so. That goes here, Vs. Uh, you're told in a lot of cases, both of your numbers of turns here, or you're just told the ratio of them, the turns ratio. Find the voltage across the primary based on that, that kind of question. Current is similar, just knowing which one you're looking at. And then in the event that you're asked about power, it's always the same as far as we're concerned for either. That's actually how we got from this voltage equation to the current equation. So power is always the same. Um, so this example is like more or less the extent of um, transformers on the exam. AC circuits. Um, let's see. So this was all introducing the idea of phasers. What's more important here is the actual application to resistors, capacitors, and inductors. So I'll say that as far as information goes, if phasers still don't make sense, look at this page and some of the stuff that's posted on the, the Wiley page. But as far as like, if phasers make sense and you're just trying to like study some things, specifically look at the information about resistors, capacitors, and then inductors. Um, I, I won't say it won't help to have maybe these graphs in your equation sheet. So the phasor diagram and uh, the plot right here and these ones, especially the reactant stuff, those plots uh, as a function of frequency. Um, but I'm not gonna ask about if current lags or leads voltage because it's easy to get confused about, well, if current leads voltage, voltage lags current. So you can get a little mixed up on which goes where. And I don't think that's really memorized or understanding. It's just something that can get confused and that's not what I'm testing on. So um, whether it leads or lags, it's not important as far as the exam goes. We just needed it for figuring out stuff for RCL circuits. Uh, so that line, I guess, is a little bit irrelevant. For sure, need to be able to, if you're given a capacitance and a current, find a voltage or a voltage and capacitance, find a current, and you also need that frequency. So this bit right here, very important. Similar for inductors, um, power, the only thing you need to know, so this was all just a means of getting to this, is that average power for capacitors is zero, average power for inductors is zero, average power for resistors is not zero. It is the only one that is not zero on average. And then good old Ohm's law. 
Um, so examples on capacitive reactants, good. Don't need lags here. Plot you don't really need, but maybe it helps. But it would probably help to have this one and really this whole kind of bit on inductive reactant stuff. Um, power just that it's zero on average for inductors. So like I've said in class, this chapter is very plug and chug. There's a couple, let's see, there's a couple no work required type conceptual questions, but not many, I think maybe two. Let me see. Okay, there's three for RCL circuits. Um, and so this really took a lot of work to kind of get to the important bit. The important bit for RCL circuits is the relationship between voltage and current, which is through that impedance, what the impedance curve looks like, and the phase angle. And then down here, so this is good practice of calculating impedance, using that to find the current, and then calculating phase angle we do in a second here because it's important in calculating average power through that power factor. So that's why you need the phase angle is to calculate power factor. So all the examples in the chapter are good. You may notice most examples from all chapters are good because what would be the point of them if they weren't helpful. Um, resonance, I'd say approach from a more conceptual point of view. The only equation that shows up for resonance is really this one right here. But even that, don't worry about so much as what does resonance mean? What's its consequences? It means you have a large amplitude. In this case, that's a large current. And that happens because you have the voltage and current lining up. You have a lot of current flowing. There's not opposition from the inductor and capacitor because they're working together nicely to kind of push energy through the circuit. You have the max power delivered at resonance. And so as a result, you get the largest possible current. Um, so yeah, let's, let's say that one's not as critical as just realizing what resonance means, which is a large current. And that is a result of a small impedance. So to summarize, resonance is large current, small impedance, zero phase angle. So voltage and current are in phase and maximum power delivered to the resistor because the capacitor and inductor don't use that power overall. The resistor is what uses it up. Okay, that is everything. So questions before jumping over to practice problems. Okay, um, then maybe we'll just jump over to them. Are there any specific practice problems that you have picked out that you want to look at before I just pick a couple? For number two, are we using the right right hand rule the first or the second one 
the first one. So this is the one that I did email out about uh, saying that it doesn't have the correct choice, which is up, if I remember right. Um, so does that maybe address it? Yes, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, in that case, it was actually the test bank itself just got that one wrong and I didn't go in to check it. So north to me means up towards the top of the page. That's how I look at it. But again, north, south, east, west will not appear on the exam. We have that kind of separate coding of things. Um, field points east. And so my thumb would point up. My fingers would point to the east. And so right hand rule would tell me that for a positive charge that's away from my palm, that would be in this picture into the page. But as far as if you're thinking about holding up a compass, north and east are like kind of parallel to the Earth's surface. So that would be downward. But we're talking about an electron. And so we flip that to find the force direction for a negative charge, and that's up. So that's why the answer is up. Okay, other questions? thinking I'm sending an email. Okay, questions? All right, well, let's just pick a couple then. How about this one? A beam with five types of ions labeled A through E, enter a region with a uniform magnetic field as shown below. The field is perpendicular to the plane of the paper, but its direction is not given. So first thing, perpendicular to the plane, that means if this is the sheet of paper, it's perpendicular to that, that's into or out of the page are our two options. Um, all ions travel with the same speed. So that's just telling us speed is not a factor in figuring out whatever's asked about here. Uh, the table gives masses and charges of the ions. So three of them are positive, two are negative. And then we've got different masses going on here. What is the direction of the magnetic field? So my first instinct would be to say, well, the direction these charges get deflected when they enter this region depends on the direction of the field and the sign of the charge. So I see three going this way, two going the other way. It must be that the positive charges get deflected to the left when they enter this region. So I can use that if they're all entering that way, that's my velocity. And then if they're deflected to the left, that means they feel a force to the left. I can use my right hand rule to say, which way do my fingers need to point uh, of my two options into the page or out of the page to make a positive charge feel a force to the left. So this is where you have to be careful of 
which fingers and palm and all that is, is telling you what. My thumb needs to point up on this paper. My palm, the face of it has to be to the left. And so between my two choices of my hand pointing kind of up out of the page or down into the page, it has to be that my hand's pointing into it, which I honestly don't know how to draw from this perspective, but I don't know, something sort of going into the page because that's the only way my thumb could point in the direction of that velocity and still have my palm facing towards the left. So that is the answer is into the page. Um, and that is also consistent with what the other side does, the negative charges, because they should feel a force exactly opposite the direction my palm's facing. And that's what makes them deflect the other way. Okay, um, which ion falls at position two. So now I'm looking at my positive ions. That depends on the mass of these because we only have one equation that tells us the radius of this motion, although again, that's not emphasized on the actual exam. It's this one right here. We said the velocity is the same for all of them. They're in the same field. And then they all have the same magnitude of charge. It's all plus or minus E. So mass is what makes the difference. The larger the mass, the larger the radius. Although really I could just immediately say it's B because it's the one in between. So it's not the smallest, it's not the largest. But if we wanted to know, for instance, what three was, that's the smallest radius. That's going to be the smallest mass. And so this one is A, this one is B, this one is C. Um, I go to the other side, this one must be D, and this one over here is E. And so uh, ion B is the one that falls at position two. And I'm just going to do this one too. Determine the magnitude of the magnetic field if ion A travels in a semicircular path of radius 0.5 meters at a speed of five times 10 to the six. You know what, I, I won't do this in full detail just because I said it's not emphasized, but it's just calculating this thing. So you would put in your radius r, um, your speed, that's v. You put in for your mass, since one mass unit is this, um, and it's i on a, it's two times that. And then for q, they're all plus or minus this. And we don't put the plus or minus here. It's an absolute value because we've already figured out the direction. It's just about the radius uh, of that circular path. So that's how you would do that. Uh, okay. Other problems we want to look at. Don't have any you want to look at. I, I wouldn't think you'd be at the review if that were the case. Could we look at number 17? Sure.
figure has a three Tesla magnetic fields. So that's B, normal to the plane, a uh, conducting circular loop. So plane just means that if you had like a bubble, like you, you put bubble solution in that loop, the plane of the bubble. Anyway, um, with a resistance, 1.5 ohms, we use R for that, a radius, 0 0.024, magnetic field is directed out of the paper. This note area of non-circular portion is negligible. That's just saying ignore this if you're interested in calculating or finding an area. So just worry about the loop. What is the magnitude of the average induced EMF if the magnetic field magnitude is doubled in 0.4 seconds? So if it's doubled, it went from three Tesla to six Tesla. The area of the loop didn't change. The orientation didn't change. We're just talking about a change in field. So induced EMF screams Faraday's law. Because it says the induced EMF is the negative of the number of loops times the change in flux over the time it takes. We have a time, we're asked for an induced EMF. And yeah, that's the main things. So we have to see if we have enough to apply Faraday's law here. Well, I'm given time, so I don't need to worry about that anymore. N is the number of loops. We've just got one loop here. So N is gonna be one. So I really just have to worry about this flux. I don't even have to worry about the negative because we're asked about the magnitude. So the flux, how it changes. Well, flux in and of itself, it's field strength times loop area times the cosine of the angle between those two things. And if the loop orientation doesn't change, we're told it is um, normal or perpendicular to the plane, or it's normal to the field because the field is normal to it. So that's gonna tell us that this angle phi is zero degrees because again, phi is measuring the angle between the normal to this loop. If we look at it from another perspective, that's our loop. It's saying, again, that Nerf dart stuck to the tennis racket, which direction it points compared to the field direction, they're in the same direction. So the angle between them is zero. So we really just need to worry about B times A and how it changes. So change in flux is going to be the change in B times A. That is the final value of it minus the initial value, but the area of the loop never changed. So that's the same, we can pull that out. It's really just the change in the field strength. So we put that back up here. This is gonna be, if we're taking the magnitude and I wouldn't fault you. I don't think if, if you put a negative here, but you don't need one. It's one for the number of loops times this change. So A times B minus B zero over the time. And that's gonna be one is you're just multiplying by one, the area of the loop. So, I don't know that, but I'm given the radius of the loop. So it's pi r squared. That's not on the equation sheet, so that's probably a good one to know. Um, pi times 0 0.024 meters squared is the area of that loop, which, what's that gonna be? Pi times 0 0.024. 0 0.0018 square meters. I put that in up here. 
My final field strength was six. We doubled it from three. We did it in 0.4 seconds. And so if I just, this is really a mess, but my induced EMF is going to be 0 0.0018 times six minus three, which is just three over 0 0.4, I get 0 0.014 volts. Uh, looking at significant figures too much. It looks like um, one is the lowest one, which would actually say we wouldn't report anything here. But anyway, what does the solutions and we'll say this is 17. Yeah, 0 0.014 volts. Okay, this type of question is likely, I'll just say it. So calculating an induced EMF and the current resulting from that induced EMF is on there. So how you would find that current is the magnitude, it's just saying, how large is this current? It's my induced EMF, because if none of that is like internal resistance um, of the wire, then EMF is equal to the voltage and my resistance is 1.5 ohms. So that's going to be 0 0.009 amps or 9 milliamps. So magnitude is the easy part. Direction is the tricky one. But like we said, um, so we didn't see induced current. We did see induced EMF. So maybe that's a little bit misleading, but that's still telling us we saw a change in flux. He used Lenz's law to figure out which way the current goes around this loop. So in this case, what happened was we originally had flux out of the page because that's the direction the field pointed. The magnetic field was doubled. That's going to lead to more flux out of the page because our sort of graphical interpretation of an increase in field strength is more field lines. So you can think of it as more pointing out. Nature does not like changes in flux. It tries to oppose them. So, and I'm gonna point out, I'm gonna go back to Lenz's law and following this process. Um, so I found whether it's increasing or decreasing. And more than that, I found which direction that's happening so I could figure out how to oppose it. So it's increasing out of the page. I need to decrease the out of the page flux. And that's going to happen by having flux into the page from the induced field. So we are trying to decrease that outward flux. Once we figure out that field direction, which in this case is going to be into the page to oppose that increase in outward flux. So our induced field points this way into the page. I then use my second right-hand rule to figure out which way the current has to go to create that field. In reverse just means usually we're given the current and we find the field. Here we're given the field, we find the current. And so my second right hand rule says for my fingers to dip into the page here, my thumb's gonna have to go that way, All right? That's the only way my fingers can dip into the loop. And so I get that this should be 
not only nine milliamps, but nine milliamps in a clockwise direction. And then the last step, although we're not asked for it here, is that that tells us the polarity of this induced EMF. Because this current's flowing through the resistor this way, it must be that this is the positive side of the resistor and this is the negative. Current flows from high to low potential. So that is the optional fourth step. Really, a lot of the time you're just asked about the current. So let's see, nine milliamps clockwise. Is that, yep, nine times 10 to the negative three, so 0 0.009 clockwise. Okay, oops, this one. All right, other questions? Nineteen and twenty. Okay, this is more lenses law stuff. So long straight wire. Wire carries a constant current, which is true if the wire is suddenly moved towards the loop. So again, we see something about induced current screams lenses law, and this one even tells you lenses law. But let's start here. So we want to know about what's happening in this loop. So we're interested in how the flux through that loop changes because that's what's important for determining the induced current in that loop. So we need to think about what the flux was originally and how it changed. Originally, before we move this wire closer, what it's doing, it has these circular field lines which wrap around like that. I'm using my second right-hand rule just to figure out the direction of the field. So this is, if I know the direction of the current, I can find the direction of the field associated with this wire. That's why we can't do that for this one. We don't know the direction of the uh, current or field for that wire at this point. So I know that this field wraps around like that. And so at the location of this loop, this is that idea of thinking about the direction tangent to the field lines. That's going to say that the field is pointing into the page. So into that loop. Um, if that's not clear, maybe it'll give a different perspective. Oh. Let's see, something like that for the, the wire. Now, what's gonna work better is if I draw it this way, sort of a side view. So this is my loop looking at the side of it. So I'm looking from over here. And my current's pointing out of the page. If that's the case, that second right-hand rule tells me the field lines circle in this perspective counterclockwise. And so, and they form these bigger and bigger circles, right, radially outward. So at the location of the loop, the tangent to that field line is downward. And from the original perspective, that's into the loop. If we bring that wire closer, how is that going to change the flux? through the loop. Could you repeat the question, please? If we bring 
this straight wire closer to the loop? How does the flux through the loop change? Are you going to have less or more field lines pointing through the loop? And are they going to be more field lines into or out of the loop? More into, we're moving this wire closer it has these field lines, field vectors associated with it. And just by kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say common sense, but uh, the field's stronger closer to the wire. And so if you bring the wire closer to the loop, you have a stronger field through the loop itself. You end up with more field lines pointing into the loop. So that tells us that the flux into the page increased. Nature doesn't like when that sort of change happens. It tries to decrease it. We need to decrease the flux into the page with this induced field. The way we decrease the flux into the page is by having a field that points out of the page. So that's the direction our induced field is going to point. Then we apply our second right hand rule to say in order for my fingers to dip into this loop, and it doesn't matter which side I do it on, say I do it on the left side of this loop, my fingers need to dip in. In order for them to do that, my thumb's got to go that way. That's the only way my fingers can wrap around like that. If I do it up here, my thumb's got to do that. Over here, that, and then up here. So we've got a clockwise current induced in this loop. And so that is C. Ooh. Nope. I got ahead of myself. Very far ahead. What was my mistake? Let's learn from my mistakes here. Okay, my mistake was I was drawing the hands for a field that pointed into the page. My fingers dipping down into the loop like that. But we said our induced field should point out of the page. And so in that case, it gets a little bit more difficult to try and draw it, but my fingers should be coming up out. So that means the current is counterclockwise? Yeah, my, my thumb should point the other way. And I could draw the hand all four times around, but you got the picture from the first case. So should be counterclockwise around the loop. So let's check that 19 counterclockwise around the loop. All right. So directions are, are the tricky bit here. Um, 20, two loops carry equal currents in the same direction. If the current in the upper loop suddenly drops to zero, what happens to the current in the lower loop? 
So um, we have to think about the field that's originally through the lower loop and what it is if this current in the upper loop is suddenly gone. And so this is another one where we need to find a field direction first. So that's kind of the difference between these and some other Lenz's law problems is there's not a field given. In that case, you do usually have to use the second right-hand rule to figure out the direction of the original field. And then you follow the Lenz's law process. So um, let's see, current in the upper loop suddenly drops to zero. Originally though, what was that current doing? What kind of magnetic field was it creating? One pointing up, meaning up that way or down? up, correct. So my thumb's trying to wrap around like that. My fingers have to go under, come up through the loop to be able to follow that current direction. Okay, so the original field is pointing up. Really what it's doing is circling around and going up. But as far as this lower loop is concerned, erase that. It originally had a field pointing up through it. And we don't, we're not concerned about the field of this. Well, that's actually not right. So we are concerned about it because it does contribute to the field that is through it. So this one is also up because the current is going in the same direction around it. So we do originally have an upward flux through the lower loop. If we suddenly turn off the current in the upper loop, we have a sudden decrease in flux upward. We need to put it back. Nature doesn't like changes. It wants to go back to the way things were. And so it wants to put the flux that was lost, meaning the field that was lost, due to the, the current in the upper loop shutting off, it wants to put it back. So what does that say about the direction of the induced field in the lower loop? Let it decrease it. So the flux did decrease as a result of the current in the upper loop going away. But the induced field is trying to increase it, trying to oppose that change. So which way should the induced field point in order for it to increase the flux again? Since the original was going up, was that mean the flux would have to do the opposite and go downward? So think about what the flux was like before and after this current in the upper loop went away. Before it was this strong upward flux. After it's just the upward flux due to the lower current, the one in, in the lower loop. So we lost some upward flux. We're always trying to oppose changes. So if we lost some, nature's trying to put it back. So the induced field should point up through the loop as well. And then second right-hand rule, although in this case, you know, it's just sort of doing the opposite of what we did at the beginning of the problem says, we should have 
an induced current that points in the same direction as the original current, and so increases it. So should increase. So we get here. Let's check that. And current in lower loop will increase. So I think this one's worth recapping. There's a lot going on. Um, and I'll draw these back in. So the original state of this system, the original thing that was going on for the lower loop, which is the one we're interested in the induced current in, is that it had an upward flux due to its own current and due to the current in the upper loop. Both have a field pointing upwards. And if we turn this current off, we lose that field due to the current in the upper loop. That's the change in flux that happens through the lower loop, is we have less pointing up than we did before. Nature opposes that change by trying to put some of that upward flux back, having an induced field that points upward to mitigate the fact that we lost some of that upward field. It's always trying to undo whatever happened. And so for that to be the case, the induced current in the lower loop has to be, uh, in this picture, I guess I call that counterclockwise. And so that's in addition to the current that was already there. We have this induced current. Those both add together. It's an uh, additional motion of charge. And so that's why the current in the lower loop increases. OK, other questions? I can do about 15 more minutes, so now's the time. Okay, I'm gonna go with this one. It's another Lenz's Law problem. And it's another one that's slightly more involved, but it's still the same idea. So, we've got two coils. We wanna know if we close the switch on the left coil, what happens? So, it's asking about an induced current that's Lenz's law. I am honestly not going to read the choices because all I'm really wondering about is just the directions of things. And if I follow Lenz's law through to the end, I'll know the direction of absolutely anything that it could ask me about. That's especially relevant in cases where it's saying which one is true. Because if you try and go through and say, is this one true? And then show that and then figure out if it's not. Then is this one and show that. It's just going to take longer. It's easier in this case to just follow through the whole process. So <clears throat> let's think about what happens if we close that switch. Current is going to flow this way because it flows from the positive of terminal of the battery to the negative. And so it's going to flow up around 
each of these coils. And so that's going to produce a magnetic field. We've got current flowing. This is a solenoid, but again, you don't have to worry about the whole solenoid. You just have to worry about one loop. So which way does the magnetic field associated with this current point? Towards A or towards B? Yes, towards A. So the second right-hand rule, my thumb goes along the direction of the current. The only way my thumb can comfortably do that is if my fingers wrap around so that they're, let's see, what's the best way to draw that? Shouldn't say best way, what's A way? It's definitely not the best way. So I'm not even sure that's clear what that is. Um, what does the rest of the hand do in that case? It has to sort of go like that. I think that's worse. But hopefully you can sort of picture applying that right hand. So it does point towards A. And field of a solenoid, it is sort of this wraparound thing. But all that's really important is if it's pointing out from A, it's pointing in around B, so to the left. And so we went from no, and maybe it's better if I draw these lines kind of extra. We had no field, and then suddenly there is a field pointing to the left. It was going through coil two. So that's going to induce a current in coil two because that's a change in the field it's experiencing. So we went from no field to a field pointing to the left for coil two. That is an increase in flux to the left. Nature doesn't like that a change happened. It tries to oppose that change. It doesn't want it to increase to the left. And so it produces this magnetic field to counteract that. And so it must be pointing to the right. Okay, then we think about what current through the second loop through coil two would be able to produce that particular field. Well, it's going to be the one that's going exactly the opposite direction of coil one because that resulted in a field pointing the opposite direction. But we can still just always use right hand rule. It says, um, my thumb is pointing down like that. Let's see. I'm like staring at my hand to try and get this right. My other fingers sort of do that to be able to dip through the loop over here. Okay, so that means the current's going that way. And so if I kind of backtrack that around the loop, my current's going up and then around this one, down around this one, down around this one, so on and so forth, uh, all the way until down through here. So that's the way the current goes around this loop. All right, I've pretty much labeled everything I can about this, except maybe that's the positive and that's the negative terminal, because that's the direction the current goes. Um, and now I'll look at my choices. So an induced current will flow from right to left in capital R. Well, that one looks pretty promising, but let's look at the rest. An induced current will flow from left to right in little r. 
So we actually never thought about the induced current in our first coil. Um, let's see, we had a field to, we had no field, then suddenly it's to the left. And so uh, we actually would have, let's see. We would have the exact same situation for coil one. So it had no field and then um, it has a field to the left. So it needs to have a um, induced field pointing to the right. And so it needs an induced current that allows that. And that's gonna be the same as the one we just found for coil two. So it would have an induced current that points in the same direction as the original one, which is right to left through that resistor. So that one's out. Magnetic field that points towards B appears inside coil one. And it points toward B. I'm going to have to guess that that means like the net magnetic field because it's not going to completely cancel the original one. So it will still point to the left and not towards B. But the induced field should point towards B. So that one's a little, little odd. Let's, let's put a pin in that for a second. An induced magnetic field that points towards B appears in coil two. That one's definitely out. It points away from B. And a current will pass through little r, but there will, there will be no current through capital R. Also not true. We do have an induced current in the capital R resistor. So I say flows right to left in um, my capital R resistor. And a magnetic field that points toward B appears inside coil one. I at the moment disagree with that. We'll see what the uh, solutions thing says, 22. Yeah, flows from right to left in capital R, the resistor in coil two. So I'm thinking that one's a poor choice of wording in that the overall magnetic field will still point to the left. The induced field does not completely cancel it out, but there is a magnetic field that points towards B that appears inside coil one. So that one's a little bit misleading. Okay, um, got time for probably one, two more questions. What do we wanna look at? Or is there any clarification needed on this one? If I went too fast or it got a little confused from drawing, let me know. Okay, something from chapter 23. All right. Um, crazy. So there could be one like these. Um, as far as conceptual questions. And so this is just asking about the frequency behavior of different circuit elements. You've only got three, you've got resistor, capacitor, and inductor, and they all act differently depending on the frequency. So this is where it can be helpful to have those curves in an equation sheet. But these are what those resistance, capacitive reactants, and inductive reactants look like as a function of frequency. So resistance doesn't change with frequency. Capacitive reactance decreases with frequency because it's about how it reacts as it fills up with charge. If the frequency is very large, so the fields uh, or the currents alternating really quickly, then the capacitor never really fills up and so doesn't provide any opposition to current flow. If the frequency is really low, there's a large opposition to current flow. 
because the capacitor has plenty of time to fill up with charge before the direction of the current reverses. Inductor is exactly the opposite. If you have a low frequency, you have a very slowly changing magnetic field if it's changing at all. Um, and so you don't have a large induced EMF in that inductor to oppose the original generator battery EMF. If you have a large current, that's a very quickly changing magnetic field, that's a very large change in flux, you get a large induced EMF to oppose the original EMF of the generator. So it's a large um, resistance to current flow. The question is about if you decrease the frequency, the current increases. So which of these is going to lead to a larger current? It's the one that resists current flow the least as you decrease frequency. Which one is that? All right, if it's not intuitive, you can always jump back to formulas. That's the RMS over XL. Barely squeezing it in. Okay, let's see. So if the frequency is decreased, we're looking for the thing that provides the least opposition to current because that's what's going to lead to an increase in current. I'd say it's the inductor because if we decrease frequency, that inductive reactance goes down. We have less opposition to current flow in the inductor. So we can get more current flowing. Um, again, it's always helpful to think of capacitive reactants and inductive reactants as just what resistance is for a capacitor and an inductor. If the trend makes sense for this case, which really you'd have to lower the resistance itself, but that would still lead to an increase in current. These, it's also about if you lower these, the current increases. The only one that lowers as frequency decreases is the inductive reactants. So it should be inductors. Let's see. Inductors. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump straight to one with impedance, because if you can do impedance ones, you can do capacitive reactants and inductive reactants. In fact, if you want to, just always start with the impedance formula and set stuff to zero that doesn't show up. If there is no resistance, throw it away, call it zero. If there is no inductance, call it zero, so on and so forth. Um, one second. Okay, so we have a generator supplying a peak, not RMS voltage of 150 volts. So it's telling us that's V naught, not the RMS at 60 Hertz. Generators connected in series with an inductor, capacitor, and a resistor. What is the capacitive reactance? What is the inductive reactance? I'm gonna kind of sidestep those because I'm gonna to need to calculate them for the impedance anyway. But the idea here is just to kind of handhold a little bit, say, you've got those now, how do you find the impedance? But let's just find it. So this is what I'm saying of, you can do this for, um, if it's just an inductor, for instance, you'd set XC to zero and R to zero, F squared of XL squared, that's XL. That is what you use for just an inductor. But 
we have all three here. So I am not throwing them all out for this problem. Okay. Um, and resistance has no simpler formula, but these it's two pi F inductance minus one over two pi F capacitance. Square that, take a square root of everything. That is 85 ohms squared plus two pi times 60 hertz times inductance 35 times 10 to the negative three. Um, Henry's minus, oh boy, how are we going to squeeze this in? Let's shrink that down. Minus one over two pi. I gave myself all that room and I didn't use it. One over two pi. Um, 60 hertz, capacitance was 45 microfarads, so that's 45 times 10 to the negative six, oh boy, farads. That's all in the denominator. All right, take all that, square it. What do we get? So it's, it's this whole thing all squared. Um, 2 pi times 60 times 35 times 10 to the negative 3 minus 1 over 2 pi times 60 times 45 times to the negative 6. Square all of that plus. 85, yeah, 85 squared, square root. I get 96, 97 ohms. Yeah, I guess I found that to 97. So let's just check that before I dig a deeper hole. Okay, 97 ohms. RMS current, once you found the impedance, is the easy bit. It's just Ohm's law with resistance replaced by impedance. It is. So we do have to be careful because I was given the peak voltage RMS. I still, just like on the last exam, it's uh, peak over root two for RMS. And then 97 ohms. So if you're given an RMS voltage, you're fine. If you're given a peak, you just have to do that one extra step. Uh, 97, 1.09 amps. Power factor, I'll just outline here because I have to get going, but. Um, Remember, power factor is cosine of this phase angle. And so you have two ways of doing this. You could use how we got to it. It's R over Z. And so if we know the impedance and we know that resistance, that's one way of calculating the power factor. Or or you could first calculate the phase angle itself. It's the inverse tangent of inductive reactance minus capacitive reactance over resistance, and then just take the cosine of whatever you get. So this way is faster, but it really just depends on what you have to work with. Um, Okay, average power, only one formula for that. It's IRMS, VRMS, 
uh, cosine phi. So again, this whole thing is the power factor. And then resonant frequency, I said calculation for this is not gonna be super critical for the exam, but it's just one over two pi square root LC. All right, that is by and large what the chapter 23 stuff will look like. It's just calculating some things about an RCL circuit. Maybe you've got a certain circuit element um, that you're given some information about and you're asked what type of circuit element it is. Um, or something about you're given an impedance curve and you tell me something about that, that sort of thing. Okay, last, last, last minute questions. I can't do a full like example, but if there's like any lingering doubts on anything, maybe I can clear it up real quick. Well, all right, if there are any questions, as always, email me um, day or night, any time before the exam. Remember that if you have not used your test corrections yet, you'll be able to and should on this last one when you get it back. I will be trying my absolute best to get it graded over the weekend so that you have it back on Monday so that you can get it back to me on Wednesday corrected. And then you'll have to pick it up in my office since Wednesday is the last day of class. Um, I'll have them done by that Friday. Uh, other things, there's again, those extra examples uh, specifically for chapter 22 that are posted, although they have a lot of chapter 21 content kind of baked in. I would really recommend looking at those, especially the Lenz's Law ones, if Lenz's Law is still not making sense. Um, and if there's just additional questions, just ask. I think that's that's my spiel. All right, thank you. We'll see you all on Friday.